How have you been enjoying the series, Unpacking the Parables? Have you been enjoying it? I know it's been a fantastic series to really just get into the words of Jesus and to really understand not just what was said, but what does it mean for us today? Um, It's an incredible honour to be here today to unpack this particular parable um, of the sheep and the goats. I've been really looking forward to um, doing this and Uh, This morning we had a wonderful time with the congregation and there was a lot of prayer for each other so I'm I'm really excited and pumped up as to what God might have in store for all of you here tonight. For those that you don't know, I work for World Vision. Um, I've worked in the space of international aid and development for pretty much the majority of my professional life and um, you know I think it's, it's interesting what God sows in your heart, isn't it? For a very young age, I was really broken by the things that were of injustice and poverty. We had this coffee table book in our house when we were growing up and we didn't have that many things that were fancy and this book was very special and there was lots of pages of pictures of all sorts of different things but there were three pictures that really stood out and caught my eye. One picture was of some small children who were really malnourished and starving out of one of the famines in Africa. And another picture was of the slums in Calcutta. I know that Jonna and Nikki will appreciate this. And, you know, it was Mother Teresa caring for someone with leprosy. And the last one was a picture from the turn of the century about slavery and about the injustice there. And I remember really at that very young age thinking, this isn't right. There was something in me that I wanted to connect with being part of making it the way God intended. I share this now because at this stage in my life where I've spent pretty much nearly half of it working in this space, there's times where it's it's dry and it's dark and you think, I don't know, what, what was that thing God sowed in my life? Is that is that supposed to be that thing I hold on to? Is that supposed to be the thing I go after? And I think, don't doubt that. Sometimes we doubt it because we think, oh, maybe it won't be enough. Actually, that's exactly the right place because it's where there is n- it's not enough that God says, that's when I do my best. That's when miracles can happen. And I really just feel like, particularly in this message tonight, if you're in a space where you think, hey, this is something I've been holding on to, God, I've been trying to faithfully go after this for the least, the last, the lost, and it just feels like it's not really coming together, be patient. Be patient because I think God is there blessing it now as it matures and grows and will continue to bless it as you faithfully commit it to him. This week I was privileged to be in Bangkok. Uh, We brought in all the leaders from Asia, East Asia, South Asia, Pacific into Bangkok. It's easier to get your visa uh, permission to get into there. So we had all our teams um, together and it was just incredible, so inspiring that the leaders of of all these countries across Asia and the Pacific are really just sharing how hard it is to really be there and what responsibility it is to be there for the least and the last and the most vulnerable. Um, And do pray for us. We are one of the largest NGOs in the world. We're also the largest Christian NGO, and that doesn't come without its challenges. But there are many faithful people in leadership in World Vision, and, you know, they need your prayers as well because it's tough out there. I have to tell you, though, the parable of the sheep and the goats is a powerful message for us, for this church here in River Life, and for God's church, the global church today. Let's just bow our heads in prayer before we get into the message. Jesus, would you speak to us from your word? My prayer today is that each person here would have the fullness of revelation that you intended from this parable. Convict us, challenge us, inspire us, God. Change our hearts today, not out of duty or out of guilt, Lord, but out of this realisation of this incredible gift of grace that through that infilling, we might be able to pour out your kingdom here on earth to the least, to the last, to the lost, to those right in our neighbourhood. In your mighty name, we pray these things. Amen. You know, a parable is a short story, simple story. Oh, this is great. I can see you all now. (laughs) Um, Used to teach spiritual truths. Uh, you know, compares to earthly situations that we might understand. 
But in today's parable, it's a mixture of spiritual truths and, and application together. In many commentaries, it actually talks about it's a, it's a prophecy because it's speaking to an event that will take place, that is the future, the final judgment. If the parable of the sheep and the goats is the crescendo, then we need to back back and build into this parable a little bit and go back to where Jesus was talking to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, starting at verse 16. Jesus was uh, in a crowd and a rich young man came to him and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus said. There is only one who is good, and if you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. Which one? He inquired. Jesus replied, the Ten Commandments. All these I have kept, he said. What do I still lack? You know, it's interesting here, this young man, that gives us a clue. How many times have we heard older people saying, those young ones, they're very arrogant, you know, they've got an ego. You know, in my house, I've got now a teenager, and sometimes I call him a punk because he's got a bit of an attitude. You know, there was a tone about the questions that this young man was asking Jesus. You know, there was a bit of theatre in his dialogue and he knew he had an audience. Now, it may be hard to believe, but when I was at uni, I was very much uh, wanting to make a mark and make it fast. And I would go to conferences and I would study the topic within an inch of its existence so that if the chance existed in the question and answer time, I could shoot up my hand confidently and I would be able to say something intelligent and I would even pretty much have known what the kind of answer would be so that I didn't look foolish or in some way lacking. I had this idea that that would somehow get me noticed with someone who might hire me or employ me in the future and that would be a fast track. You know, I am sure that this young man, being a Jew, already thought he knew the answer to this question. I'm pretty sure that he had an idea that there'd be an audience that he could perform to when he asked this question in front of Jesus. You see, he was a, a part of the ruling Jewish elite, and they not only thought they were going to the kingdom, but they thought they were somehow keepers of the kingdom of God. So he was pretty confident that he was going to have the right answer. But you know what was funny is that the law alone wasn't what Jesus was interested in. In fact, compliance to the law wasn't even what Jesus was interested in the most. You see, Jesus was looking for something more. Let's see what he says. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. See, this young man understood that the keeping of the law should qualify him for eternal life. Yet Jesus wanted to examine his priorities and his motives. The young man's riches and lifestyle were something of importance. Jesus wanted to test how important so he had two more conditions. The first one, sell all your possessions and your resources and give to who? The poor. They're unclean. They're sinners. They're tax collectors. What kind of crazy are you asking me to do here? Why give something so lavish to someone so undeserving? What is Jesus talking about? And the second, leave and follow me. But hang on, if I leave my audience here and I follow you over here, Jesus, especially when I've lost all my resources, that, hang on, but I might not be able to buy my prominence. I might not have the same pull of the crowd. Leave and follow me. This rich young ruler went away sad. But you know what was really interesting about this passage, which I think speaks to the church, was that the disciples had their own reaction to this. See, this young man's crisis quickly became their crisis because they were in, in the realm of not only eavesdropping, but they were in the realm of comparison. They quickly fell into the trap of comparison. What I'm doing and what I'm doing with my saviour, I don't know, I'm not maybe as much as that person. If not him, who then can be saved, they said. See, by Jewish society standards, this young man was righteous. 
He was devout in practice. He outwardly had the appearance of a righteous man. Maybe he got here early, not at five or 10 past. Maybe he was, you know, had his Bible with him, not just his iPhone. You know, it may be all the outward things, he was good to go. But Jesus was looking for something more. He was challenging the motives and the heart attitude, the tre- test of a true disciple. Jesus' words align with the passage uh, about salvation. There's nothing here that contradicts any other passage and the place that works have. In Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, it said that salvation is by faith alone, through the grace of God and not by our good works. But it is the good works that flow from one's life that are direct overflow of that heart relationship that exists between a servant and and a master, between the saved and the saviour, between a sheep and the shepherd. Jesus was trying to have a conversation about righteous things, about righteous behaviour, about the heart, about the sacrificial commitment to him and love of him, where the rewards of that would be dispensed at end times when the judge of, judgment of all would come by the Son of Man. So now we find ourselves in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus is teaching at the Mount of Olives and he's teaching his disciples about the end times. And up until this point, he's been using metaphors. He's been using parallels. He's been explaining that the sheep are like the the prepared bridesmaid. Anyone went to the brown wedding yesterday? Okay, a few people. You don't want unprepared bridesmaids. Okay. I mean, there's enough drama at a wedding. So he was comparing to the wise bridesmaids, the prepared servants, and the goats as the unprepared and the unwise. But in today's parable, Jesus makes no, no confusion. He's speaking plain. He's not speaking in metaphors anymore. Please turn to your devices. So we had the morning service. Most of them pulled out their Bible. <laughs> um, it was up on the screen. So it says, When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. I love this. This is so cool. It's one of the most intense word pictures of Scripture. God just really wants us to visualize this moment, this incredible event. I fly a lot and I love the window seat. I really like to not be disturbed. Uh, But I love looking out of the window and I see the sun setting and rising in all different places. It is spectacular. But can you imagine the son of man, the king in all his glory returning? When Jesus came to earth as a baby and he lived as man, he had emptied himself of his heavenly power, of his authority. He had taken the form of man, clothed in human frailty, it tells us in Philippians 2. Jesus is, well, around the disciples when he's telling this story, Jesus is just like us. But in this story, he is coming back in all his glory. He is coming back in all his majesty, in all his power, in all his authority. Come on. I mean, that is amazing. Can you imagine this? The bit I love the best is that he comes back with all his angels. In Revelation 5, it tells us that there are 10,000 by 10,000. Now, I had to ask my son, who's in extension maths, how many that is, 100 million. Uh, But that's a lot of angels, right? There's a lot of angels. It's not going to be quiet, all right? It's not going to be like the shepherds on the hill. It is going to be a noisy, spectacular, terrifying thing. Just try and imagine what that's like. Every person in every nation gathering. Now, I was in Bangkok airport on Friday night. It felt like every person in every nation was gathering. Uh, There were queues. There were people doing weird things. There was definitely, um, you know, the nationals were going to be on the left and the foreigners on the right. There was a queue for the, you know, dignitaries, which I'm sure never traveled in this airport. Um, Anyway, it was not a celebration. There was a little bit of anxiety, you know, no one was smiling at the check-in place where they check your passports. There was a lot of stress. The air conditioners were not up to speed. You know, generally, it was chaotic. Just get a picture of what this is going to be like when the Son of Man returns in all his majesty. It's at that moment God will bring all things to completion with the return of his Son. It's on that day, everything 
in heaven and on earth will be set right, including where we each spend eternity dependent on what we do in this life. In this life. Jesus continues, As he will separate them one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Okay, is this going to be that hard, really? I mean, sheep look like a particular thing and goats look like a particular thing. It can't be that difficult, really. Okay, I didn't realise that in the Middle East, a matted sheep and a matted goat kind of look quite similar. Uh, Do you want to have a test to see if you're smarter than me? Yeah? So I just need you to be able to say sheep or goat, depending on which one you think. All right, give us the first one. This one is a goat. Next one. Sheep. Next one. Goat. Okay, you're getting it. Next one. Goat. What about the next one? Oh. Watch out for that one. What about the next one? Both. Both. It is common to this day that if you are herding sheep and goat in the Middle East, you often herd them together. So how do we tell them apart? How does the shepherd tell them apart? Is it the horns? I mean, it sort of looked like you were going with something there. You know, was it the horns? Actually, you can't always tell by the horns. Sometimes a sheep and a goat's horns are very similar. What about the coat? I mean, surely the fleece and its wool and goats have hair. But actually, I was surprised to find out that goats can have fur or hair coats, or sheep can have fur or hair coats too. Actually, what really tells them apart is the behaviour. The behaviour tells them apart. It comes down to sheep are very social. They tend to like clover and fields and they graze together and they're peaceful as a herd and they don't wander off. Um, goats, they're more independent, as you would have guessed. When it comes to eating, they typically get very uh, curious. They're browsers, they eat shrubs, they wander off and even scavenge. I, you know, John's had to go to pick up my son, but my gosh, he is like that in India. He's a browser, he disappears off after a food van, and then I sometimes find him down some other street. Um, They will become curious, and because they're so curious, they often become disobedient, ignoring the call of the shepherd to pursue something that's caught their attention. You know, the shepherd tells the goats and the sheep apart by their heart, by their behaviour, by their character. He wants to know if the creature has a heart that follows him, or a heart that wants to be independent and go off on their own direction. See, we're talking about a heart matter. It's not easy to distinguish that from the outside appearance. God's eternal kingdom is for those who love him with their entire hearts, who desire is to follow him and not go their own way. God's looking to see if the creature will be at home in his pasture, or will be constantly butting his head against the thing of the kingdom. God's looking at the heart. Let's turn from verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. See, prepared for you since the creation of the world, it wasn't they even hadn't started doing any good works then. If there was ever a doubt that it wasn't about works, there you are. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison, you came and visited me. Then the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When when were you thirsty and you needed a drink or a stranger and we invited you in? Lord, when were you sick or in prison and we visited or cared for you? When did you need clothes and we clothed you? Then the king will say, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. See, the sheep, they're righteous because they demonstrate God's heart for the least, for the lonely, for the lost, for the poor, for the marginalised. God rewards them who are by love compelled through faith 
and obedient to express God's heart in action and in so doing bear much fruit. See, those who don't bear much fruit can't expect to have the same share of the kingdom. They definitely can't expect to feel that comfortable. God will separate his obedient followers from the pretenders and the unbelievers. So the real evidence of our belief is the fruit in our life, the way we act, the way we treat all persons, as if we were encountering the very Jesus that we profess to love and serve. We need to remember that the Gospel of Matthew was written for the Jews. They primarily did not appreciate or even struggle to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. This mirrors the prophecy in Ezekiel 34 verse 36. It says, As for you, my flock, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the goats. This is a clear statement that the Son of Man, Jesus, the promised Messiah, the judge, the king, his words must be seriously considered. For the sheep, it was natural to them that when there was hunger, their offer included the bread of life. When there was thirst, they provided living water. When someone was lost, they shared their best friend, their saviour. For every sickness, they knew the healer. For everyone who was enslaved, they shared the good news. The good news that through Christ Jesus, every ransom had been paid and every shackle had undone. Their love and service to others of both the physical and the spiritual was not fake, was not out of duty, wasn't a task. It was a result of truly understanding this amazing grace that had been lavished on them, something they had not deserved. An overflowing of his compassion, his spirit within them being expressed through them. They didn't even realise the significance of what they had done. When did we do this? You see, they were not perfect, and this is so important, they were not perfect But God looked at their heart and declared, here is my child, here is the kingdom. Be rewarded with eternal life and my blessing. Jesus now turns to the goats, to the unrighteous, and he says from verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devils and his angels, for I was hungry. And you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you didn't restore my dignity, you didn't clothe me. I was sick and imprisoned and you did not look after me. And they will not display God's heart. Depart from me, he says, those of you who are cursed. We see the king making his decree. He's not entering into a dialogue. He's no longer Jesus knocking around in the flesh with them on the road. He is the Messiah. He is back and he is the judge. He doesn't need to have a dialogue. He already knows their hearts. See, many of the Jews were keeping moral, upright upright lives, abiding by the law. They were even quite prosperous They felt that was a sure sign of God's blessing on their life. When are we guilty of not doing these things, they're saying. He looks at them. It is an act of omission. It's an act of omission. You are so busy looking at yourself that you don't have time to look up for the needs around you. It's an act of omission. Jesus concludes this parable with a final statement. See, it doesn't matter how much you protest of your goodness, you cannot save yourself. You cannot merit your way into the kingdom of God. He says to them, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous will enter eternal life. This is such a profound parable. It is all about the heart. It is all about the heart attitude. And through that heart attitude, gifts 
of service and love that speak directly to the poor, to social justice issues, to social responsibility. This is proof positive of our love of God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that a life spent loving and serving Jesus delivers. You see, in the Bible, there's over 2,000 verses that talk about issues of poverty and injustice. They're there to wake us up. So we're not focused here saying, when did we not do these things? They're there to wake us up and say, look out, look around. Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O mortal one, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. None of us could suffer more than what Jesus suffered on the cross. None of us could pay a bigger price than what he paid, the heavenly father paid by sending his son to die on Calvary for us. But River Life, if we are truly going to be his hands and his feet, if we are truly going to be the sheep and not the goats, we have to allow God in, God in to go in and deep. It's got to be all in. We sing about this all the time, all in. So he can do a mighty work in and through us, which is the purpose of God for us. See, John says much, to bear much fruit, we're on this planet to advance his kingdom. Yeah, his kingdom, not, not our kingdom, not river life, his kingdom. I love the verse in the message for, for John 1 verse 14, and it says, and the word became flesh, and it moved out into the neighbourhood. Sometimes we might get lost in, in translation, and I typically don't read the message, but this particular version of it, I love so much. The word became flesh, and it moved out. We are only as good as how much we move out, how much we are his hands and feet. You know, there's a pastor um, in America, he's a friend of the River Life family, Pastor Steve Thompson, and he posted something this week on Facebook that really moved me. I don't know if you know, but this week was uh, World Refugee Week. And also you would have seen on the news some horrendous things happening in border protection in the US. And he posted this message and it said, upset about the kids at the border, indifferent to the ones next door. Compassion at a distance is cheap and easy. Compassion up close is costly, but it changes lives. You know, I know how to live this out when I'm in Myanmar, in Africa, in India, in Nepal. When we lived in India, I just had to open my front door every day as I walked to the office, and I could have a smorgasbord of need to respond to. I didn't have to look very far. Whether it was the beggar at the corner or the taxi driver that hardly had clothes or some kid that was begging at the lights, I, I had so much I could respond to. But then it's just a flight, sometimes three, and I'm here, I'm back home. I mean, I don't even work in an office when I'm working from home, I work from home. I have this routine where, you know, get John and the kids out the door, pretty much lock it behind, get the vacuum out, clean it all up, make it calm so I can get as much work done as possible without distractions. Uh, I'm a serial offender at working through lunch because I just need to get everything done before they come home. And as I was preparing this message over the last few weeks and uh, in and out of being at home, I kept hearing God say, just look out, just look out. I'm like, okay, yeah, got it. You know, look out of ourselves. Yeah, I've put it in the message. Thanks, God. Yeah, got it. And I just kept hearing it. I was like, I'm trying to get other things done. I'm kind of serving you, writing the message over here, but I've got all this other day job to do too. And uh, I just kept hearing this thing. You look out. Just stop and look out. So it's like, okay, I, I, I'm not going to see anything. I live in Mogul, right? I live, there's not much happening in there. It's not even Monday, God. There's not even the garbage truck collector that I could bump into. So I, I just, I went out the front door, I poked out, I went, okay, you happy? Because there's nothing happening out here. And then I saw this tree in the front that's in a pot and it's kind of dying. I thought, okay, I'll get the hose. So I got the hose and I'm watering my pot. And then I hear this, oh, you are there. Oh, hi, I've got kids too. I live around the corner. And this lady come hopping across my neighbour's lawn to have a chat. I was like, where did you even come from? I don't even know who you are. 
And we started talking, and I watered for the next 20 minutes, and she talked, and I listened, and she shared about how tough it was with her small kids, and two of them have some fairly challenging health issues. She was in the middle of a very rough day, which was feeling like a prison for her. You know, it wasn't until I finished, you know, there was no counselling, there was no, you know, deep moment. There was just genuine being there. And I found that when I chose to stop, put my agenda over here for a second, and put my timing down for a minute, and just walk out my front door and look around, that I had what it required to talk to this mother. I had the time. I got more done that day than I had got done, I don't know, in the last few days. And God just said, look out. Look outward. See, it's not about what you and I can do or not do. It's not about who we are or who we're not. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about who Christ is in us. Is Christ in here, in our heart? You know, it's time to make God bigger. What's she talking about? God's as big as he needs to be, right? It's time to make Jesus, what Jesus did for us, bigger than our fears, our anxieties, our sense of not being enough. It's time to make what Jesus did on Calvary bigger than our own agenda, our own stuff. How do we make God bigger? You know, God is as big. God of the universe is as big or as small as we make him in our hearts. Let me say that again. The God of the universe is made as big or as small as we make him in our hearts. Some of you here need to make God bigger. The greatest testimony that Christ is still alive is when we let him move in, into our hearts and transform us and through that transformation, flows great works, fruit. You know, we are his plan A. He doesn't have another plan. We are his plan A. If we don't do this, he doesn't advance his kingdom. He doesn't need co-stars. He needs co-laborers. This is what we do to build resilience up, to go out into the neighbourhood. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives in us to give us the grace to do what we could never do in our own strength, to move into the neighbourhood, to live out justice and compassion to the least of these. If you want to be a sheep, not a goat, you have to make that decision every day to make him as big as the God of the universe in your heart. He, he doesn't want anything less. It's all in. It's all in.